Dear Father, we are thankful even for these genealogies, as uh, they may seem copious at times to comprehend. We are thankful for them because they trace your promises. We are thankful that we can rest on your promises and that you've given us a record so that we can see your faithfulness in times past and trust you in times to come. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, you may all be seated. As you can see, I relented on Paul this week, and I didn't make him read all 17 verses of genealogy. I guess I relented on you guys too, but we will cover it in the sermon this morning. The main point, the world was divided into nations for safekeeping against sin. Remember, God had destroyed the entire world because the entire world was operating together before the flood. He created the nation state so that when he had to destroy a nation or a people for corrupting themselves, then they were isolated from the others, and God did not have to send a global judgment once again. From one of those nations, though, and from a narrow line of offspring, God promised to produce the Savior and the ruler of this world. Now, if you don't have an outline, you might want one. They're out in the foyer next to the bulletins. Uh, they look like this. You guys are probably getting used to this by now, but it bears repeating. We are answering the question in this sixth series in Genesis, who can save us? We saw all of mankind trying to save themselves at the Tower of Babel, trying to make a name for themselves, but it was God who would ultimately give them their name. He gave them the name of confusion and ultimately their record will be a record of sins piled as high as heaven, not a tower reaching to heaven. And so this begins this morning, God's answer to that question, who can save us? He returns to the same genealogy he left in chapter five, and he begins to give us that answer. So this morning we will look at Shem's seed, those generations that came from Shem. Now, as we are coming near the end of a year in Genesis 1 through 11, we've got a lot of wrapping up to do. So there's going to be a few repeated themes that we'll, we will see, such as the Toledot structure of Genesis. If you remember, Genesis is broken into 11 different Toledots. These are genealogies. The genealogies are actually the structure of Genesis because they trace God's promise from Genesis 3.15. So our passage this morning began, these are the records of the generations of Shem. We are moving from the Toledot of Noah's sons in Genesis 10 through Genesis 11, 9, which traced all of Noah's sons, Shem, Hem, and Japheth. Remember, this wasn't a linear genealogy. It didn't go down through the generations. It went wide. It went broad to show us the dispersion of mankind across the globe. Now we are going to go deep into a genealogy. We will go linearly down through Shem's line. Back in Genesis 2-4, we saw the first Toledot, and this was the account of the heavens and the earth. After God had created them, he told us what became of them, what came out of them. And ultimately, we saw that sin and corruption came out of them because of man's disobedience. And so God gave us the beginning of his record of promise that he would restore, and we get the book of the generations of Adam. Then we get the generations of Noah. It's as if God is handing down the baton from one patriarch to another, through whom this promised seed would come. Genesis 10.1, the generations of the sons of Noah, and it's all uh, tracing this promise given to Adam and Eve through the curse on the serpent back in Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. God is speaking of a future descendant of man and woman. He has told them that in the day that they eat from the tree, they would die. They have every expectation of death, and yet God is promising life. In fact, in the man's curse, God even says, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The response from man 
should be disappointment. It should be mourning their death. But instead, their response is faith. This stands out as a beacon in chapter 3, which otherwise is full of man's sinfulness. Here, we see man's faithfulness. Adam and Eve get a tough lesson in what it means to trust God's word, not to take it for granted, not to twist and mutilate it, but to hang on every precept. And Adam does exactly that. Now the man called his wife's name Eve. He's hanging on the promise of progeny from the line of Eve because she was the mother of all living. Man is sentenced to death, but promised that through his generations, a savior would come. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. He allowed them a temporary reprieve from their sin until that sin could be paid for. And so these genealogies, they are tracing the progress of this promise down to Adam's son, Seth, 10 generations forward to Noah, then to his son, Shem, and this morning, 10 generations forward to Abraham. Now, when we get into this text, these 17 verses of genealogy, we see that these, just like in chapter 5, are a tight genealogy. There is no room in them for gaps. When Shem was 100 years old, he became the father of Arpachshad two years after the flood. We have this now connected to the date of the flood. But we also see back in Genesis 5, 6 through 8. Oops. I'm jumping ahead here. In Genesis 5, 6 through 8, we see the same exact pattern given. This is a continuation of the genealogies in chapter 5. You remember that Noah's genealogy ended with a parenthesis, which was the record of the flood. That was just a parenthetical story because it had deep importance for mankind. As we return, we see that same pattern. Just like Seth lived 105 years, and then he fathers Enosh, then he lives uh, 807 years, etc., this all follows a regular pattern. A lives X years, A fathers B, A lives Y years, and after fathering B, A has other sons and daughters, A lives a total of Z years, and A dies. The same exact structure repeats here because it is the same exact genealogy. It's just picking up where it left off. Now, our Pakshad was born two years after the flood to Shem, but our Pakshad was not the first son of Shem. Elam and Asher were both born before our Pakshad. No one but Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their three wives got off the ark. Therefore, we can understand that no sons had been born to Shem before he got off the ark. So we also don't have decades between births of children. There are three children born within the span of two years just to Shem alone. This is as fast, if not faster, than we produce children today. The population was quickly growing, and it grew to thousands, if not tens of thousands, in just the hundred years between the flood and Babel. Now, ten more generations forward, and it's probably grown near a million, if not a few million people. But there is something different between the genealogy in chapter 5 and the genealogy here in chapter 11. The last two points... A lives a total of Z years and A dies, are not present in chapter 11. Back in chapter 5, we were tracing the consequences of sin. God is going to spare man, but nonetheless, man dies. In every generation, we have a reminder. Man dies, man dies, man dies. Here, that's absent. God is fulfilling his promise to bring life to mankind. And so although each generation these men die, we are not reminded of that. In fact, its absence almost reminds us that we are heading towards life in this generation. 
Nevertheless, in not receiving these directly, we don't lose any information. As you can see, the total number in Z, the total number of years lived, is just the, rec or the addition of the two numbers we already received their life before and their life after giving birth to the seed son. You see, Shem lived 500 years after he became the father of Arpachshad, and he had other sons and daughters. If we add those numbers together, we can see that Shem lived 600 years. Moses is being conservative in his writing. What we can clearly understand from the pattern already presented in chapter 5, he doesn't repeat. We don't need that. It doesn't add to the context here. But we can still understand that there is no room between Shem and his son Arpachshad for another generation. I gave you this example back in, I think, December. If Virgil lives 49 years and then he fathers Jeff, and then Virgil has other children, and Virgil lives 39 years after Jeff was born, and then Virgil lives a total of 88 years, and Virgil dies. These numbers don't change if you realize that Virgil and Jeff were actually separated by an additional generation. It doesn't change my great-grandfather's dates to see that my grandmother came between my great-grandfather and my father. The same thing is true here in Genesis 11. Although there is no reason to add a single name between any of these genealogical records, an argument for adding generations in between doesn't actually change anything. It would add a name, it couldn't change the dates. And that's important because here, for almost the first time, we come to a major textual variant. Now, that's probably not a term you are familiar with, and you will probably regret having heard it after I explain it to you. But I think you guys can bear with me through this. I'm also trying to get you familiar with Greek, because in two weeks, we start to transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament for about six months. But there's a textual variant here in Genesis 11, verse 12. Arpachshad lived 35 years and became the father of Sheila. The problem comes that in the New Testament, there is an additional name between Arpachshad and Sheila. It says that Arpachshad was the father of Canaan, and Canaan was the father of Sheila. Luke 3.23, we see this is in the generations of Jesus. As it goes down to verse 35, Peleg was the son of Eber, and the son of Sheila, the son of Canaan, the son of Arpachshad, and the son of Shem. How do we reconcile this? How do we deal with that? Well, the first thing we do is not freak out. We go and we look at the manuscripts from which we get our modern English translations. We weigh the evidence. God has preserved it for us. We ought to use it. You see, it's very likely that this was an addition by copyist error. The New Testament is inerrant in its original autographs, the original Greek that was written down by the author Luke, or by a scribe of the author Luke, was absolutely inerrant. And copies were made of this. And in fact, so many copies were made of it that even if one makes an error, we can usually identify that error. And I think that's what we have here. In Luke 35, it would be very easy to transcribe either by tired eyes or tired ears, depending on whether this scribe was copying a visual copy or listening to a dictator uh, read out Luke's original autograph. So he adds at the end of a line here to Kainim, the son of Canaan, not because it's just something he simply adds, but because it comes later in the genealogy anyways. Perhaps he simply transcribed that. Now this looks like it might be a difficult mistake to make, but bear in mind when the original Greek manuscripts were written, there were no spaces between any words. And they were also written in capital letters. This can be a bit of a jumble, a bit of a mess especially when your eyes are tired after 
hours and hours, if not days and days and months and months of copying to make a copy error. This occurs from time to time. And this would be a simple fix, if not for the fact that the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible written about two years, or rather translated, about 200 years before Christ. The issue is that the origin of the Septuagint comes before Luke, and yet the Septuagint also adds Kenan. This is where people start to say, Genesis must be wrong and Luke must be correct. There must be an error back in the Genesis record because the LXX has put Kenan back in chapter 11 of Genesis. This is actually not a problem because Luke and Josephus both quote from the Septuagint. Luke, whenever he quotes an Old Testament passage, he usually takes the words directly from the Septuagint. He doesn't translate the Hebrew words into the Greek and then put them in the Greek. He uses the ready and present Greek translation to write them into his Greek gospel. So Luke, who quotes from the LXX, the Septuagint, just like Josephus, who quotes from the Septuagint, and in Josephus, who quotes from the Septuagint, there is no presence of Canaan. Josephus wrote in the first century. In fact, he was present at the war at Jerusalem in AD 70. Jerus or Josephus wrote his works about the same time that Luke was writing his. So why does Josephus not have Canaan, but Luke does? We also have this issue in the Septuagint. When we look at the dates, we see that Canaan's dates are simply a copy of Sheila's dates. He lived 130 years, and then he had a son, and then he lived 330 more years, just like his father, Sheila. Now, 130 years is a pretty good bet, because <clears throat> that is the most common number to pop up in these genealogies in the Septuagint. Now, we're not going to deal with the fact here this morning that the Septuagint erroneously adds 100 years to each one of these dates. Uh, that is also a textual error, but... The, uh, the only reason I'm going through this one in Luke is because I actually am in the minority here in claiming that it is not supposed to be present in Luke. I would not be in the minority to claim that the 100 years additional to this Septuagint passage is original. That is a majority view, so I'm not going to bother with that. I have to defend my position here to you, though, this morning that Genesis is absolutely correct and there is a textual error in Luke. You see, the majority of manuscripts in the Greek Testament also have Canaan, but the oldest one does not. <clears throat> this is usually why people go along with it being present in Luke and then say we must change it back in the Old Testament, because we don't have that many uh, variations or manuscripts of the Old Testament. It was a pretty tight tradition of passing it down through the Hebrew authors, through the Hebrew scribes. The New Testament's a bit messier. Those witnesses which do contain Canaan are very strong witnesses. The Alexandrius Codex, the Cyprius Codex, the Petropolitanus, these are from the 5th century, the 9th century, the 6th century, Tischendorfian from the 10th century. These are not as strong, though, as one that adds, instead of Canaan, Canaan. These are some of the strongest witnesses with the Codex Sinaiticus of the 4th century and the Codex Vaticanus of the 4th century and the Codex Regius of the 8th century, as well as an entire group of lectionaries from the 12th to 15th century. In fact, the Nestle Alland Greek New Testament chooses this variant with only how many? Five strong witnesses against this one with dozens of strong witnesses. Why? Because the strength of these witnesses is simply overpowering. But they do have two witnesses that do not have Canaan present in the text of the New Testament. 
And this is the Papyrus 75, better known as the Bottom of Papyrus, and the Codex Beze, which uh, Erasmus used as part of his Textus Receptus. The P75 is usually dismissed despite being from the second century, which is the oldest copy of any gospel we have. Because this word is not clearly uh, absent or present, but it appears to be absent. They cannot confirm its absence, but it does appear to be, and in Codex Beze it is absent. So here is a witness from the second century and from the fifth century. Some of the earliest possible witnesses do not have Canaan in the text. And then let's add to that the fact that no Hebrew text has ever included Canaan between our Pakshad and Sheila. The first Septuagint uh, manuscript that we have comes from the 4th century, 300 years after Luke was written. It is probable that the original Septuagint did not have Canaan in it but that although Luke copied from the Septuagint, at one point the Septuagint copied backwards from Luke in a transcriptional, uh, making a transcriptional error. Another strong bit of evidence here, when these genealogies are repeated in First Chronicles, the LXX forgot to add Canaan from Luke's text back here. Goes from Shem to Arpachshad to Shelah to Eber to Peleg to Riu. The Septuagint has the same thing. It is more consistent not to include Kenan's name here in Luke or in Genesis. It is simply a copyist error, and it is not part of the inspired text. This makes people uncomfortable. When you look down at your NASB, it says Canaan, between Luke 3.36 and 3.37. How can you trust your Bible if there is a word in there that's not the original? Well, we can trust the originals, and that we can settle on. And from that point forward, we do the best we can to reproduce the originals. And our ability to do that is, in fact, Tremendous. We have at least 5,000 different copies of the Greek text. And we have another 19,000 copies of translations and lectionaries. This is far, far, far beyond any other historical document that we have. In fact, if we can't trust that we can reproduce the original of the Greek text of the New Testament, then we can't trust that we have anything accurate from Shakespeare, from Homer, from Herodotus, from Ovid, from any historical author. If we can't trust the Bible, we can't trust anything from history. The evidence is simply tremendous. Oops. So let me read this statement by the... Um, well, the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. I think this will help a lot. We affirm that the inspiration, strictly speaking, applies only to the autographic text of Scripture. That means the original document as it was written, which in the providence of God can be ascertained from available manuscripts with great accuracy. We further affirm that the copies and translations of Scripture are the word of God to the extent that they faithfully represent the original. We deny, however, that any essential element of the Christian faith is affected by the absence of the autographs. We further deny that the, this absence renders the assertion of biblical inerrancy invalid or irrelevant. Remember the tightness of this genealogy. Whether or not Canaan is present, which it should not be, it doesn't change the dates at all. In fact, of the errors, or the text, uh, the copyist errors, 
Not one changes an essential Bible doctrine. Not one. We have the original autographs to a great trustworthy degree. So our Pakshad lived 35 years, and then he fathers Sheila. Then our Pakshad lives 403 years after following, fathering Sheila, and he has other sons and daughters. Now notice, other sons and daughters means he has at least four children beyond Sheila. Noah, in fact, is the only one who can possibly have fewer than five children. Noah has three children and no others are recorded. In fact, there's good, good evidence that he did not have more than three. But all others list at least one and then say they had other sons, plural, and daughters, plural. Then you get someone like Joktan who has 13 sons and probably daughters beyond that and possibly more sons beyond that. People were having children rapidly and in a great quantity. The Earth's population was quickly growing, but so were mutations in the gene pool. And so we get shrinking ages. Notice here, Sheila now lives 30 years. He fathers Eber, and Sheila lives 403 years, a total of 433 years. Remember, Shem lived 600 years. His father, Noah, was the third oldest in recorded history at 950 years. Why are the ages shrinking? Eber actually lives the oldest of these patriarchs after Babel, or at the time of Babel. He lives a total of 464 years. At that time, that was old. But this was about half of the length of Noah's life, his great-great-great-grandfather. Pelig, Eber's son, only lives 239 years. We have another drastic decrease in the ages. We go from 950 down to 601 generation, then down to 438. Then in three more generations, we've got it just at 239. By the time we get down to Nahor, we have 148. What is happening? Long gone are these long ages where everyone is living over 900 years, and when Mahalalel dies five years short of 900, he dies young. Or Jared and Methuselah living almost to a thousand years old, with Enoch being taken from the earth without dying, and Lamech being an outlier living only 777 years. These are all patriarchs before the flood. Something happens after the flood, which makes Shem live only 600 years, Arpachshad 438, Shelah 433, Eber 464, Pelig 239, and down we go. Probably the biggest contributor is a genetic bottleneck, where God created Adam and Eve with all of the perfect genes that he intended humanity to have, but then only eight people, 11 generations from Adam, get on the boat, which is actually only five different possible gene pools, with Noah and Noah's wife having different genes, and possibly, but not necessarily, the three wives of Noah's sons having different gene pools. We get a drastic narrowing from millions of people down to just five bloodlines. All of the genetic diversity has now been narrowed. Whatever is present in one single family is what will be present in the world from that point forward. Imagine if we did that today. Imagine if you took, for example, just my family. There would be no more dark hair, there would be no more brown eyes. There might be no more short people. <laughs> Randy Newman would be pleased. But then this happens again at Babel. But now, 
it's divided into 70 smaller groups. These will go across the earth and they will develop in their private gene pools separately from others. In this dispersion, they're going to new lands with new challenges. In their spread, in their travels, it's likely that they will live hard lives. Living a hard life tends to make people live younger or uh, die younger. I read a good book a couple years back about pioneers in the deep Canadian woods. To cut to the chase of the end of that book, not many of them make it. And those who do die in their 30s and 40s, having lived a full life, at least passing on their genes to another generation. They had to be foragers. We know they had the capacity for greater civilization. We saw that in Babel. But as they're moving, they have no time to build up a civilization like they had at Babel. They make rudimentary tools so they can drop them and go, or so that they can make them quickly for a new hunt. They are moving. And as they get into these extreme parts of the globe, where climate and weather is far different than it was in Mesopotamia, their lives will be harder, their mutations in their genes will increase, and people will begin to die earlier. Plus, we don't know what kind of challenges they faced when they were uh, heading to all these new places. People dying of accidents, perhaps crossing the Pacific or the Atlantic. We have gene pools narrowing even further. Add on top of that, the flood caused an ice age. All those volcanics and all that water would evaporate, deflect the sun, move over the continents, and freeze the earth. Babel was no warm paradise. We were on the upward slope of the globe becoming harsher and harsher. In fact, up until Abraham's day, things were still cooling. Abraham is actually the peak of the Ice Age when it starts to go back towards warming. But notice as well, there is something odd about Noah's son. Because Noah only lived 500 years in the antediluvian world, the world before the flood. And he lived 450 years into the new world. And he lived to be the third oldest recorded. The environment wasn't the biggest issue because Noah, for half of his life, lived in the same environment as everyone else who is now dying younger. The answer might lie in his father, Lamech, who only lived 777 years. If he didn't die by an accident, there is perhaps a genetic mutation that was recessive in Noah's line, or in, uh, in Noah himself, but expressed himself in his sons. You see, the genes for aging are just like the genes for hair growth or for melanin. They limit how much can be produced. Everybody has melanin, the same melanin in their skin, but our genes determine how much or how dense that melanin can become. The same goes for genes for aging. They limit just how old we can get. If Lamech's genes limited his age to 777 years, and this gene was recessive in Noah, and then expressed itself in Shem, then we see early on that we have at least one corrupt bloodline with this mutation that is going to limit ages. This bloodline coming through Noah would be present in all three of his sons at least as a recessive gene, and so would be present in each one of the people who would come from any of his sons. And remember, that is the entire world. 
ages began to decrease. This gene may have also come from Mrs. Noah, but I'm, I'm pointing the finger at Mr. Noah most of this, uh, through most of this. The other issue is Noah's age at the birth of his sons. Notice that Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, they're all having sons less than 200 years into their lifespan. Most of them, or some of them, even before the first hundred years. Noah, on the other hand, waits 500 years before he has his first son. Now, this is why I place the blame on Noah, because the male reproductive system is different than the female reproductive system, and more mutations are possible through the male's side than through the female's. This is probably not what you expected to learn on Sunday morning. But the spermatogenesis of a male's reproductive system goes through what is called meiosis and divides. In fact, one sper I can't even remember what it's called. There we go. Primary spermatocyte divides into four. Whereas in oogenesis, I think that's how that's pronounced. The female's egg, though it does divide, one egg turns into one ovum. You don't have four different possible mutations there. In fact, the female is born with all of the oocytes, oocytes that she will have for her whole life. A male, however, produces sperm throughout his entire lifespan. And so the result is this, where the duration for a man's production is an uninterrupted process. The female's is an arrested process, meaning it happens periodically. Males begins at puberty. The females begin as a fetus because she will always have the number of eggs that she will have for her whole lifetime. A man's releases continuously, the woman's only monthly until menstruation or uh, during menstruation, but the end is where things get interesting. A man can produce new sperm through his entire life, but a woman can only produce eggs until menopause. At some point, Mrs. Noah was no longer able to have children. She ran out of eggs. This would never happen to Noah, but the older he gets, the more chance of mutations. In fact, every year, as humanity stands today, every year, the chance of genetic mutations passed on by sperm increases by 1.5 mutations. So in two years, you have three new mutations from the man's reproductive system. If Noah is living 500 years, and if this number is anywhere near 1.5 way back then, it might have been 0.25. It might have been 0.1. After 500 years, that's still quite a bit of mutation. So even if this was not present in Noah's father, Lamech, the chances of Noah, after 500 years, having some genes mutated to the point where his children are not going to live as long, and that he will pass that on to the rest of humanity as a whole, is very likely. And so we have that strange phenomena after the flood in these 10 generations where Shem is outliving the 10 generations of grandchildren that come from him. Shem will outlive Terah and live into Abraham's day. Eber is going to outlive Abraham and live into Isaac's day. I guess we can skip these. That was generation seven, eight. Nahor is generation nine. And then we come to the pinnacle of this text. That seed son that we are looking for. Not the final one, 
but where Moses is choosing to stop at this point because he's got, once again, a lot more to say about this seed son, Abram. He is going to be the focal point of Genesis 12 through 25. And he will remain as a focal point of the rest of the Old Testament and even into the New Testament. In fact, we never abandon Abraham from this point forward. He will die, but even in the New Testament, Jesus argues that Abram, Abraham will be resurrected to receive the promises that God gave to him. Abraham was the reason for Genesis 1 through 11. He was the reason Moses recorded it. And so he finally comes to that pinnacle of his book. Terah lived 70 years and he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Three sons here instead of one listed. Remember, whenever Moses does something different, we want to pay attention. He's a very careful writer. We see that Terah is going to live 205 years before he dies. And so we can reproduce those numbers. 205 plus 70 equals 100 and that should be 200 and oh boy. 70 plus 135 equals 205. You'll forgive my math skills or the lack thereof. So how many years old was he when he fathered which son? We know he was 70 years old when he had his first son, but was Abram his first son? Abram is 75 when Terah dies and he departs from the land of Haran. But even I can tell that 70 plus 75 is not 205. Abram was not his first son. Haran was. Moses, once again, highlights this number 70 to remind us of his purpose in this chapter. This number 70 is going to carry through these divisions of the nations to show Israel their special place among them. In Deuteronomy 10, 20 or 22, it is 70 persons that God brings down to Egypt to cultivate this new nation of Israel. And it's from those 70 people that he will bring the millions of Israel out of Egypt. And in Deuteronomy 32, when Moses is explaining to the children of Egypt who have now come out of Egypt, that this was God's plan for them, that this is his inheritance, that he reminds them of the division of the nations. He set boundaries, uh, the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. God looked forward to what he would do with Israel, and he divided the nations for that purpose. The purpose of dividing the nations was to produce Israel, because Israel would produce the Messiah. Why then do we have those additional two sons? Why couldn't we just get the age of Terah when Noah or when uh, Abram was born? Why do we need to know his brothers? Well, Moses likes patterns. And one pattern here is the three brothers that uh, begin a new beginning in God's program. In Genesis 5.32, we saw that Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah was the tenth from Adam. And through Noah, we entered into the new world. And so Terah is the tenth from Noah. And his three sons will be integral in this new world that we will enter through Israel. Because if you remember, the dispensation of human government ended in abject failure. Man was told to go and disperse. Man failed to do what God told him to do. This was a second fall, a fall after the flood. God had to deal with it. Again, he dealt with it by dividing them into nations to deal with them individually. 
Sodom and Gomorrah is a good example of why the nations were divided. But God's divine grace, moving from the dispensation of human government into the dispensation of promise, will be Israel. You see, Abram's older brother, Haran, becomes the father of Lot. Lot is going to travel with Abram down to the land that God will promise him, and Lot will choose the best of this land. And from Lot, through an incestuous relationship with his two daughters, will come the Moabites and the Ammonites. If you go read Numbers, you will see that the Moabites especially are an issue for the Israelites coming out of Egypt. The king of Moab wants to destroy these millions of Egypt or of Israelis because he fears for his land, the promised land that God has given to Israel. Now, Nahor's wife was Milka, and from yeah, Nahor marries Milka. From Milka come Uz, Buz, Kemuel, Hesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. Bethuel becomes the father of Rebekah, and Rebekah becomes the father of Jacob. She also becomes the father of Esau, and from Esau come the Edomites. And so where we have the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all stemming from Abram and his three brothers, we also have Israel's three perennial enemies the kingdom of Ammon, the kingdom of Moab, and the kingdom of Edom. But the point is Israel. These are the names of the sons of Israel, Israel whose name was given to him by God, but was named Jacob by his father. These are the names of the sons of Israel, Jacob and his sons, who went down into Egypt. As they come out of Egypt, the Lord speaks to Moses and says, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. This promise of land, of seed, and of blessing is passed on from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and then to all the descendants of Jacob. It was given originally to Abram back in Genesis 15. To your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. This was an unconditional covenant. Remember, in God's grand scheme of things, his first purpose in creation was dominion. His first purpose was to create a ruler on this earth who could rule under God, over God's creation. And remember when we had that special word, bara, the things which God creates, we saw that he created space, time, and matter. We saw that he created the soul. We saw that he created a new heart. David uses that language. The new covenant uses that language. Creation out of nothing. Creating something brand new, which has not been before. Israel was the last of those brand new creations that God would make. God bara Israel. God created Israel out of nothing. He created it for his purpose, and he will have someone to rule over his creation. And that ruler who will sit on the throne of Israel in Jerusalem will rule over all of God's creation. And so this covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is more than just a promise of redemption, but it is a promise of all of God's purposes coming to fruition. It is that promise that the Redeemer himself will become the king of this world. Andy Woods puts it well 
And we looked at this quote. In fact, I just copied it from my sermon about eight or nine months ago. The theme of a future earthly kingdom begins on the Bible's very first page. One day, God the Father will restore what was lost in Eden. He will again rule the world indirectly through a human intermediary, and that is the human God-man, Jesus Christ. He had to be human not just to die for mankind, but also to rule on God's behalf over this creation. This human intermediary will not be the original Adam, but rather the last Adam, or the unique God-man, Jesus Christ, who is the second member of the Trinity. Charles Ryrie says on a similar note, but responding to the rejection of Jesus Christ by the Jews in the first century. Why is an earthly kingdom necessary? Did he not receive his inheritance when he was raised and exalted in heaven? Is not his present rule his inheritance? Why does there need to be an earthly kingdom? Why can't there just be a spiritual kingdom in our hearts? Because this is not how God created the universe. Ryrie says, because he must be triumphant in the same arena where he was seemingly defeated. God put Adam over this physical creation with the mandate to rule, and Adam failed. Adam failed to listen to God. This is not a defeat of God, but through it we will see God's greatest victory. But this earth cannot pass away until God installs his ruler on the throne of this creation. Otherwise, Satan has been successful in dethroning God's king. And that simply cannot be. His rejection by the rulers of this world was on this earth, and his exaltation must also be on this earth. And so it shall be when he comes again to rule this world in righteousness. He has waited long for his inheritance, and soon he shall receive it. His inheritance is being handed down through all of these generations that we see back in Genesis. His inheritance goes from Seth to Noah to Shem to Terah to Abram to Isaac to Jacob to Judah to David and down to Jesus. Now we looked at Psalm 2, 1 through 6 the last two weeks. But we're going to finish the psalm today. This is a prophecy of the end of this world. We see that not much will change from Babel to the tribulation period. Why are the nations in an uproar and all the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. This is a prophecy of the Battle of Armageddon, which will probably be in the very last days, if not hours, of this world, when the armies of the false Christ will array themselves against Israel, God's inheritance, in order to conquer them, to defeat them, and to extinguish them, because it is the throne of Israel and no other nation that Jesus Christ will sit on. If Satan can destroy Israel, he destroys the throne which God has promised Jesus will sit on, and he will destroy Jesus' rule. And so the simple explanation of this is, it cannot happen. And that's why he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Man cannot overcome God. Man cannot overthrow God. Man cannot dissuade God's purposes any more than he can build a tower which touches the heavens. This simply cannot come to pass. In fact, the idea that they might succeed itself is ludicrous. But just as we are told of Satan in Ezekiel 28, his pride has blinded him. He simply cannot see his defeat. 
coming quickly over the horizon. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He says to me, you are my son, and today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance. They belong to Jesus, and the very ends of this earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he not become angry, and you perish in the way. Jesus will come in victory. He will leave a path of carnage all the way from Edom up to Jerusalem. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all those who take refuge in him. You see, Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the covenant promises to to Israel. And we know that these covenant promises cannot fail. In fact, in Jeremiah 31, God relates them to the very permanence of creation itself. This earth cannot pass away until God's promises come to pass. If this fixed order meaning the sun, the moon, and the stars in the sky. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. In other words, this cannot happen. Even from the very beginning of this present world, we are told that the earth will remain just as it is until God comes and ends it himself with Jesus Christ. God says, I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat, and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. This will continue even through the tribulation period until Jesus Christ himself returns in the clouds and puts an end to the kingdom of Babylon. So our takeaway this morning, the world was divided into nations for safekeeping against sin. And from one of those nations, from Israel, from a narrow line of offspring, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, God promised to produce the Savior and the ruler of this world. Let's pray. Dear Father, we are thankful for your promises. We are thankful for the record of your faithfulness, and we are thankful that we can look forward into the future and see your sun, the bright morning star on the horizon. We pray that we always keep our eyes locked on him, that we not despair at this world, but we know that the new world is coming in which Jesus Christ will reign as king. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.